to point out the frame of reference here, the 1950s and 60s in the United States was a period of fear, a period of paranoia. We sat back and watched Sputnik beat its way around the globe. We sat and, and what's, what's scary is I don't remember this. We, not, not Sputnik, I must be young. We sat back when the Cuban Missile Crisis threatened the Gulf to blow the thermal nuclear war. I remember watching John Glenn blast off in Freedom 7. I remember sitting and watching uh, when uh, Neil Armstrong put the first steps on the moon. I'm getting kind of scared here. Okay. Anyway, the point is this. Fear, paranoia, undue trust in public institutions. Okay? Any aversion from the status quo that guided what was best for America was dangerous. Subversive. Okay? An entire generation was raised to believe and trust and given very little reason to do so. Okay? That's the world I grew up in. All of us baby builders grew up in that world. We were taught a certain way. Mr. Gillespie's textbook in 1962 spoke volumes of what was missing. Okay? Two things in my life in high school changed me forever. Okay? Whether good or bad is up to my students. Okay? One thing is my first day as a junior in U.S. history at Washita Parish High School in Louisiana. I walked in and Coach Fontenot, the basketball coach, okay, was my history teacher. And we sat down and Fontenot sat there and looked at us. God, you guys are horrible looking. So I told you out there what, you, what you're looking at. And he picked up a book. It was the textbook. And he said, I want everybody to reach down and pick up your book and show it to me. So we all picked up our book and showed it to him. He said, take this book. Put it in your locker. I never want to see it again. I fell in love with him on sight. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that affect me? I have never used a textbook in all my years of teaching. Never have. And, and, the, and the reason is, Mr. Gillespie gave you a lot of reasons why. But the reason is, I don't want you to be reading a textbook. I want you to read different things, and I want you to tell me what you think. Okay? The second thing that happened is I skipped. I skipped history class one day. We had a student teacher from a local college. It wasn't Fontenot, so I didn't want to be there. And the teacher assigned us to do a book report. Okay? When I got back the next day, all the cool books were gone. No more Civil War, no more World War II, no more cool stuff. Just some old grody looking books I wouldn't have nothing to do with. And I had no idea what they were about. So I had to sit down and pick out a book to do a book report. This is the book I chose. This is the actual book. I still have it with me. Okay? And the reason is, this book changed my life. No, it's not the Bible. Okay? <laughs> this book changed my life. The name of this book is Very My Heart, It Wounded Me. Okay? And the reason it changed my life is I was forced, a teacher made me read this book and made me do a critical review of it. Okay? I didn't want to. I didn't know what it was about. I just thought the title sounded cool. Okay? So I picked this book up. And after the first chapter, I was almost in tears. And the reason is, there's something in that book that I never knew existed. And what I never knew existed was the other side. Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee is a history of the American West. It is an Indian history of the American West. Okay? I grew up in a time where the relationship between whites and Indians consisted of a Conestoga wagon barreling across the plains, John Wayne firing one shot at the back, and 45 Indians falling dead. Okay, that's the way it was. They were the bloodthirsty savages. Okay, the school alarm had to be protected. Okay, that was my perception. It never occurred to me that those people that were falling dead had a history. Okay, just like members of my generation, we were never taught that. We would never be taught that. So, bury my heart engulfed me. And I thought to myself, holy Christ, I had no idea there was another side. Okay. Um, the book was effective to me because I embraced the other side. I thought it was interesting to view things from the side of those who didn't win. Okay? For members of my generation, Bury My Heart became an iconic book, one of the first books to challenge others to authority. Okay? You know about, for example, and people in my class will, express, will appreciate this, when I was in school, one of the great American icons was George Custer. <laughs> okay. Now we know that Custer wasn't quite what we thought he was. Okay. Now, the effect of a book like Bury My Heart was so much deeper on my generation because we didn't know. No one told us. 
And I told myself, if I ever teach, and Lord knows I didn't want to then, okay, <laughs> if I ever teach, my kids, number one, are going to read Bury My Heart, at least one chapter, okay? <laughs> and they're going to know what propelled me to want to teach the way I teach. Um, as a result of this, and this is creepy because it's unintentional, over the years, I've studied history, I've taught history, and I've written history. And one commonality flows through things I've written. Okay? I write about the losers. I'm the loser historian. <laughs> okay. I write about the losers. And the reason is, think about it. They're so much more compelling than the winners. I wrote, um, I wrote a paper for the Louisiana Journal of History called The Battle of Lake Bourne, A Battle of Consequence of Valor, in which a small lieutenant took out 24 boats to stop the British fleet from invading Louisiana during the War of 1812. He lost. <laughs> lost all of his ships, got killed. But he gave Andrew Jackson time to fortify the Rodriguez Canal and slow the British down the Battle of New Orleans. We don't know Thomas Cap Aspie Jones, but it was Louisiana's version of the Alamo. Okay? The book I wrote, Germany's Last Mission to Japan, you have 52 people aboard a German submarine in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the day the war ends. Most of these people were crewmen whose families lived in eastern Germany and knew exactly what was going on when the Soviet Army came through. Okay, what is their world like? Okay, the book I'm working on right now is somewhat similar to that. The, US, the CSS Stonewall, the Confederate crews are coming from Europe to the United States to, to participate in the final days of the Civil War, and the war ends. What do you do? That's, that fascinates me. It fascinates me because what's in these people's minds? In my classes, this is one thing we talk about at length. And I think, and I guess this is a personal thing, it, it engulfs me. What happened? What happened the minute the Civil War ended and you're a slave? What happened to four million people in bondage the minute the war's over? The minute the 13th Amendment passes and you're free? The minute the 14th passes and you're now a citizen? And then the 15th passes and you can vote. How much does your life really change? So we start looking, okay, well, that's a good question. Obviously, there's a program set to deal with these people. And no, there was no program. There was a lot of knee-jerk reaction as to what to do. There was a lot of more moralistic priority as to what do we do with these four million people who have no marketable skills, no education, nothing. And now all of a sudden they're turned loose. Go, survive, see you later. Okay. That is something that happens that we don't hear about. The war ended, Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown versus Board, that's it. There's more to it than that. For example, we don't talk about Abraham Lincoln's attempts to take every single free slave and deport them from the United States. In 1863, there were two, two congressional groups sent to Belize and Guyana with the complicity of the British to form colonies which the slaves could be sent to after the war. Okay? Abraham Lincoln believed, like a lot of people at his time, that the only future for America was a white future. The races could never survive together. Okay? That's true. It's documented. Why do we talk about it? Is it important? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because these people are human beings, and they basically exist on very human criteria. After the momentum of moral righteousness after the Civil War is over with, the Compromise of 1877, look what happens. The Republicans get the White House. The South sees an end Reconstruction. What happens to four million freedmen? What do they get? They get Jim Crow. Okay? So again, this is what we have to consider when we're teaching history. Those lessons, the depth of those lessons are important to us. Okay? Um, the stories of the disaffected, I'm talking about those who don't always win. About the immigrants that came over through Ellis Island, through Native Americans. Their stories are deeper and hold greater long-lasting effects than those of the victors, simply because their welfare becomes less of a priority. Out of sight, out of mind. Okay? Yet, their stories feed upon their own momentum. Okay? They grow proportionately to the depth of their anonymity. They're always there. The best way to put it, and this is the result of my angle as we talking about this, the stories of the disaffected is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. It's there. You know it's there. And it begs to be noticed. 
of where can we fit it into what we do? What is our responsibility to say, hey guys, look, yeah, we talk about this, but these people matter too. That's the power in this. Often it is their story that becomes the controversy because it doesn't really fit into our traditional assessments. Okay? A good example is Mr. Gillespie's 1962 textbook. It's not there. Okay? What is our responsibility as teachers? And the reason I'm glad there's so many students here is you need to hear how we think about our own discipline. You need to hear how we approach this. You need to see the thought process. It may scare some of you, but then we're teachers. We're supposed to scare you. Okay? First of all, because history sells. There's big bucks in history. And we live in the ultimate market economy. Look at the competition for good history. Okay? As opposed to history as the best value for your entertainment dollar. Okay? I used to watch the History Channel. Okay? I used to watch it before I stroke truckers became. <laughs> <laughs> Our profession must strive to adhere to the sense of priority. Okay? By adhering to objectivity. We are teachers. We're trying to teach you guys to be objective, to judge the merits of something. Arrive at your own conclusion. I'm going to scare you here. That's going to involve using your mind. <laughs>